when a child is born into the world, that is the most substantial unit in the universe, right? The existing model and way of just thinking about people is to not take that seriously at all or believe anything that I said. It's to mechanize it, put it on a conveyor belt, control it, and try to tease it towards some known outcome that feels safe to humans <laughs> that have also been on that conveyor belt for the most part. Hello and welcome back to the Hannah Franklin Podcast. On today's episode, I'm speaking with Chris Turner. Chris is the founder of Moonrise, a co-working space for kids based in Atlanta, Georgia. Kids who are homeschooled and going through different types of online programs can go into this co-learning space where they can take classes or they can do their schoolwork or just socialize in a space that's been very deliberately designed for kids. In today's episode, Chris and I talk about the thought process behind building Moonrise, the origin story, how he thinks about the spatial design inside of his center. We talk about his plans for expansion, some of the regulatory roadblocks that stand in the way of people attempting to do this type of innovation and in education when you don't fit into one of the pre-prescribed boxes that people expect an education center to be. And we talk very philosophically about Chris's journey, not just as an educator, but also as a startup founder. This was a really interesting conversation, and I really hope you enjoy listening. If you enjoyed this episode, please remember to like and subscribe on whatever platform that you're listening. Please leave a five-star rating on Apple or Spotify. Thank you so much for being here. All right, let's get to the show. Chris, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me, Hannah. I'm so excited that you're here. I'm so excited we get to talk about Moonrise. I'm such a fan of what you're doing. I'm a little upset I haven't actually gotten to see it yet, which is totally my fault because I haven't been through Atlanta. Um, it's such a cool space, though. All the pictures I see are amazing. I think I'm going to be in Atlanta in June. I want to come. I want to come visit if that's allowed. <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely allowed. Love to have you. <laughs> um. I imagine that a lot of people who are listening are familiar with Moonrise because you're very active in a lot of the education conversations, especially on Twitter. Um, but can you give this super quick summary of what you're building for those who haven't seen what you're doing before? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so there's a the the first thing about Moonrise is I think it's a brand new thing in the world. So there's been ways that we've tried to describe it before, you know, compared to things that already exist, right? So I can tell you it's not a school, it's not a daycare. Uh, the closest thing that I can call it is a co-learning space. And, you know, really what that, the, the thesis behind it is that, you know, kids are basically assumed to be in school during the day. So like the, the real world of physical reality was built around the premise that kids are basically like in a certain place in a certain building and completely cut off from the rest of the world from eight o'clock to three o'clock. And for the most part, eight o'clock to five o'clock, five days a week. And with all the things that are happening in the world, flexible work, uh, ed tech, um, post COVID sentiments towards education, this whole premise is, is breaking apart. And parents are finding that the existing model of where kids should be during the day is not working for them. And so the first step to building a world where that is no longer the case, you cannot get to a world where the, the education system is radically different if you don't first build different places for kids to be at during the day. So it just so happens that pretty much the only place that kids are able to be at during the day is called a school and schools come bundled with pre-existing curricula and, and a lot of other things too. And so simply all we've done is remove the curriculum piece, like the standardized component of this is how you learn and these are the uh, outcomes that we promise for you and your family. We've taken that part out and we've said, here's the space and all the good parts that everybody agrees are good about school back to you, like experiences, extracurriculars, adults there to guide your kids, a place to make consistent friends, that sort of thing. We're kind of starting there as an experiment and saying, OK, is this enough to scale a brand new education system? So practically speaking, what does 
moonrise <laughs> offer. And people can go to your very sleek looking website and they can read about all of the advertising points that you have around the services yep. that you provide. But what is the value proposition? If kids aren't getting a curriculum, then what are the things that you're providing for kids besides a beautiful space? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, I, I think the the best use case is that we provide a 10x better homeschooling experience for, for families. So the current modes of education are basically homeschooling or one form of school, you know, micro school, uh, private school, public school, charter school, whatever it is, right? So you either homeschool or you send your kids to a place where they own the learning outcomes. And homeschooling is where you own the learning outcomes as the parent or the family. And Moonrise is simply a place that's kind of in the middle of those two things that says, we will give you back all the things that you give up when you homeschool, right? So when you homeschool, you say, I own the curriculum and the outcomes. And in exchange for that, I'm also going to be giving up a space to send my kids, consistent space for socialization, um, you know, guidance with other adults that aren't me. And again, you can piece this stuff together, but it's not in one convenient place. So Moonrise basically gives you back when you homeschool all those things. And those just happen to be the things that everybody likes about school. It's the curriculum that people don't like and usually the cause, among other reasons, like bullying and safety and poor learning environments that people choose to homeschool. So I, I think the, the most practical way to use Moonrise today is a, is a 10x better learning experience for, for homeschoolers. Can you quantify the 10x part? Like what makes it dramatically better than homeschooling <laughs> on your own? Because most people would say that homeschooling is a dramatic increase in quality over being in public school. There's also such a range of sort of quality yeah. bars at which people are homeschooling on so many different verticals. Like, you know, what kind of space have you set up for your kids? What kind of experiences yeah. are you providing for them? What kind of freedom are you giving them? What is your, you know, what is the relationship between your personality and your kids' personality? There are so many variables that already yeah. exist. But talk to me about what you mean when you say 10x. Yeah. So that's a big claim. Yeah, it's a big claim. It's kind of <laughs> borrowed. It's, it's, you know, part of startup lore, I, I suppose. Like, I think it came from uh, Zero to One, Peter Thiel's book. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a it's a term that uh, founders admittedly throw around a lot. And, you know, kind of the, the thing to do is to find yourself building a 10x better product in a very specific market for a specific customer. So mm -hmm. I do think even though Moonrise serves families who are not homeschooling, I think that is our best use case. The reason it's 10x better. So Homeschooling is still, even though I, I agree with you, it is a tremendous, tremendous improvement over traditional school, um, even private school for the most part, as far as I can tell. Um, it's still a tremendous improvement. However, it is still quite challenging for a number of reasons. So the I kind of package these reasons together in something I call DIY everything, where you know when you when you homeschool, you say, okay, I will take care of curriculum, I will be the chauffeur. I will be the primary adult in my child's life. Uh, I will be responsible for setting up uh, meetings and socialization opportunities with other kids. Um, you're, you're doing all of these things kind of alone, right? And there are resources now to, to help with these things. But for the most part, those resources are very separated. Um, you know, in startup lingo, again, we call that like just a very fragmented market. And there's not really a consistent, intentionally built space designed for this use case. And so what happens is you have a lot of people that have tried to build it in other ways. So sometimes I'll call this like church basement co-ops or something like that. Mm -hmm. right? So if you move to Phoenix, Arizona, Phoenix is a bad example. But even still, even in Phoenix, if you Google homeschooling in Phoenix or pick any city in the United States, the, there's a tremendous difference if that Google search is charter schools near me and homeschooling near me. So charter schools or any schools, there will be facilities and, you know, programming and all kinds of stuff and an intentional design, not always great, but there will be a clear intentionality behind a lot of schools in cities. Homeschooling is very much like organic, just kind of meetups at local parks, museums, that sort of thing. And there's not an intentionally built space for that. So Practically, uh, all this stuff like that we provide them not only is at the level of you know what you would expect from a really good private school. I think in many ways it exceeds it. Uh, 
So for example, we provide flexible drop-ins with no set schedule. So at any time, as long as we're open, which is seven days a week, including summers, you can drop your kids off at Moonrise as long as you're a member. Uh, we stay open late until nine o'clock on Fridays. So it comes with a built-in date night. Uh, we do about 50 different learning experiences a week, including things like building rockets, learning Japanese. Uh, you know, last week we went and saw Hamilton together in Atlanta. Uh, last year we went to Costa Rica on an expedition. Um, all of this is done in a totally non-coercive learning environment too. So everything that kids learn at Moonrise is totally non-forced, non-coerced. They're all choosing to do it. Um, so, you know, the, the core bones are beautiful spaces, uh, real world experiences and built in community. So, you know, you, you have socialization space for, for childcare, if you want to call it that. And, uh, all these learning experiences that we all have bundled in a very affordable package at $250 a month. That's incredibly affordable. How many kids is the space designed to be able to handle? So it depends on the size of the space. Our Decatur location is about 3,500 square feet. Um, and it can accommodate about 300 members conservatively. Uh, I think it could do as many as 500. Um, right now we have 125 members. Um, and we can easily double. Um, I think it can go a little higher than that. And with some of these model changes that we're considering, which we can get into a little bit, um, we think we can do over 500. That's amazing. This feels like such an intuitive idea. And I'm a little biased because you know me, I'm very deeply entrenched in the world of why do we do education the way that we do? Um, and so from a very first principle standpoint of thinking about what's actually important to a child, this feels like such an intuitive thing. Why does this not exist? Why has, why aren't there things like this cropping up all over the country at breakneck pace? Why is this such a radical idea? It shouldn't be. I agree. It totally shouldn't be. This was the weirdest and hardest question to answer before I started Moonrise. Um, so I came up with the idea actually in uh, the fall of 2019, which was, you know, notably before COVID and spent basically the second half of, of that year of 2019, like writing the thesis that became Moonrise. Um, it's a couple of things. Now, now I have the benefit of hindsight of knowing how challenging it is. And so I, I think it's a number of things. Um, probably the biggest is the regulatory burden. Um, most I mean, pretty much any physical space for kids is regulated and the regulatory structure is very complicated and changes depending on where you are. Um, so, you know, the regulation standards in Georgia are different from the regulation standards in Pennsylvania, for example. And sometimes it can even vary at a, at a city or a county level. So it's not easy to open physical spaces for kids, period, even when those spaces fit in existing boxes of things that the government already knows about. Uh, which brings me to kind of the second part of the regulatory challenge is that this is something brand new that even is, even though it's very intuitive and it existed in some, in some ways prior to schools existing, uh, it is not intuitive to government officials. And the government typically, I like to say, is not really in the business of creating new boxes to check. They want to find out how you're, checking existing boxes. So if you bring something like Moonrise to the table, this literally happened, by the way, they said, here are the 13 things that are allowed for opening spaces for kids. And which one of these are you? And if the answer is none of them, then you don't pass, you don't, you don't get to open your space. So you have to find ways to creatively get that box checked somehow, just just to get to the place where you exist. Uh, to do it at the standard that Moonrise does requires a tremendous amount of design thinking and just like sensibility around brand building and that sort of thing, because education is also very high trust and trust in business typically uh, corresponds with brand, uh, you know, not just design sense branding, but, you know, the, the trust that's embedded in what you do, which kind of implies having a lot of intentionality and good people and that sort of thing. So you, I think you have to have a decent amount of 
funding and know how in order to get to the point where parents will take you seriously quickly enough to start paying you money to send their kids to this now new and unproven thing for them that hasn't exist for them. So you've just now at this point gotten to the point where you have to get over the parent psychology of being able to send their kids to a new type of space that hasn't existed before. So it is a very hard problem to solve. I've often you know, said it'd be easier to work in something like reusable rockets because it, it at least is a physics problem. Um, but once you get to that point and you establish those trusts, it starts compounding on itself and getting a little bit easier. Can you talk some about the ways that you had to get creative to make Moonrise fit inside of the boxes that made it both legal and also understandable for people? Sure. Yeah. So the legal part was the most challenging. We actually opened uh, without approval. And I got, uh, I thought I would have about a six month runway before I heard from the governments. And I actually had a three day runway. So uh, I got a letter, a cease and desist letter three days after opening Moonrise. um, How did that happen so fast? Like, does somebody have to report you? (laughs) I think so. I think we got reported. Yeah, that's uh, <laughs> that's the only way I think they would they would have found out about us. Um, uh, so we got reported, or or we didn't. Somehow they found out about us, and uh, three days after opening, I got a cease and desist from the state, and then had to go about the battle after being opened of uh, of keeping it of keeping it open. Um, and like I said, there were thirteen boxes in Georgia that you have to check, um, and you know on paper, like this is a brand new thing, a co-learning space. So, you know, it, it kind of just came down to actually working with some pretty friendly, uh, at the end of the day, regulators, like they, they saw the space and I think they, they understood that it wasn't a school. And so that, you know, there, there's also like a big part of this being like how, how often and how, um, how long the kids will be there. So most of their safety concerns are reasonably about, not letting any space open where kids can be there an unlimited amount of time every day, right? Um, without them kind of overseeing things a, a little bit. Um, so even if, you know, people might disagree with that, you can at least like understand the reasoning behind having regulate regulation standards for that. Can you expand on that one actually? Like why the amount of time is such an important point? Oh, sure. Um, I mean, it's easy to say that it's fine for Moonrise because I'm the founder and the spaces are beautiful and we have great staff. As far as the government is concerned, they can't get into the business of like objectively qualifying every single staff member and the beauty of your spaces. So they have like a fungible idea in their head of space for kids, <laughs> not like quality standards of those things, right? They're not getting Got into it. the business of quality. They're getting into the business of like, like binary existing, not existing. Um, and so it doesn't matter that Moonrise looks the way it does and has all this thought and philosophy behind it. It just matters that like, we kind of follow their programming, uh, so to speak. Um, so, you know, if you can imagine a badly run space with bad guides, then it would be not a good idea to have a child be able to be there at this new kind of like less proven thing for 14 hours a day if we were open for 14 hours a day or, or even like 10 hours a day for seven days a week right um so th- they're really doing it i think from that perspective with good intentions and it would be i think challenging given their structure to start looking into exceptions like quality standards and staff and all that kind of stuff um so that's that's why that's why the government is doing what the government is doing. Uh, I, there's always other <laughs> rabbit holes we can go down with government stuff. Uh, but that's why they're doing what they were doing. What was the second half of your question? Like why it was hard to attract parents, I think? No, no, no. We'll, we'll get to that later. Um, no, I was just curious what some of the things, like the ways that you had to get creative in order to check boxes that maybe weren't oh, right. organic to check. Yes. Okay. So... We first like made it clear that this was not a place where you could leave your kids full time. Um, so once we did that, they became a lot more friendly. Um, at first, I was actually trying to not have that standard so that we could allow more usage. And that would still be my preference is to allow usage to to expand. Mm-hmm. Um, but 
you know, given that Moonrise is not intended on paper to be a full time, like it's not a school, right? So there's not as much of a like a full time standard that we have to meet right now. Mm -hmm. um, it's better to exist than not to exist and get started on this problem. So we were willing to to cave a little bit and be more flexible on the maximum amount of hours that they could spend. Once you're more flexible on the amount of hours, then there are other things like tutoring centers that exist. Uh, and so it's really just having the government understand, okay, they're going to be learning things here too. They would, they could learn things at this tutoring center and spend the exact same amount of time there. So why give them the approval and not us just because we're not teaching one thing, we're teaching like 500 things. So that was kind of the gist of it, uh, along with having a very subtle form of leverage that I won't get into. Uh, but yes, that was, that was it. We've, gotten the exemption from the from the government so we are legally allowed to exist the regulatory environment also changed in georgia to allow for um learning pods to exist during COVID. so since we've gotten exemption from the government it's now become easier in the state of georgia to build something like moonrise that's really interesting do like that's actually an interesting angle of this to to look at i know that the regulatory issues vary dramatically by state but that they are often significant, both in how much energy people are willing to expend to make something happen in the first place. Like I think a lot of people get stuck on the regulatory stuff. Um, but also, mm -hmm. I think that a lot of businesses change quite a bit in the education world to fit inside of the regulatory boxes and that creativity gets stifled a lot more than people perhaps realize by the artificial constraints that are being put on the model. I remember I was homeschooled first grade through 12th grade, but I went to a private preschool and kindergarten and it was operating on like the bottom floor of a house. And then the people who owned it and ran it lived upstairs. And I think a couple years mm. after I left, it happened after I was gone like the whole time I was there I was there for three years I always was in like the bottom floor of this house but a couple years after they got hit with some kind of mm. regulatory like somebody found out about them and was like hey you're not allowed to have this in your house your school has to be separated by three feet from your house which is feels very arbitrary it's yeah. like it's, if it was three feet shifted in one direction you could still do this yes. but you have to move um and they ended up having to find a location and move their entire school and it became way more expensive to operate and they kept it in existence for a few year more years but they eventually shut down i think in large part because of that which is really sad because they had a mm -hmm. great program that they were running but things like that happen all the time yes. and i think it constrains the growth of and the innovation of things far more than people maybe realize are there other ways besides the number of hours that kids are able to spend in the space and I'm, i'd be curious to know what that number is like where you cap kids at how much time they're able to spend at moonrise a week um but like are there other ways that the growth of what you're doing has shifted to conform inside of the regulatory guardrails that have been put up for you oh <sighs> um those were the big ones i mean so it was really just the the amount of hours uh Having qualified staff, um, I think having a very visibly appealing space subtly influenced it. Like the mm -hmm. fact that they could see pictures of it um, and read about it on a on a nice website, I think probably helps a lot. Made it seem, I mean, this sounds bad because I'm very much a fan of mom and pop operations. But from a government perspective, I think they'd rather see something look more legitimate and run by a, a business than than a mom and pop uh, like pod or something. So I, th I think that probably subtly helps. I mean, the stated reasons from the government, are the ones that I that I mentioned, um, and then you know the the new act, the Learning Pod Protection Act in Georgia would have um, would have prevented the state from going after people like the individuals who ran your your co op growing up. Like that's what mm -hmm. it's that's what it's there for. So I mean, there there are regulatory changes happening all over the country that are making this sort of thing easier and more friendly. It's just not happening at the rate that we would like in order to see rapid innovation. Um, your point about this all slowing innovation is exactly right. 
there are so many things. This, this is what you learn by studying evolution in general. Like sometimes the things that end up gaining dominance, like start off really small and look really dumb at first. And so <laughs> it's almost like the things that look the scariest or, the, or even in some ways like insignificant and easy to squash by the government, like those things could have end up being very important innovations and they just weren't able to see the light of day and, and expand, right? And, and keep experimenting. So when you only allow certain pre-known things to exist, then by default, you are literally preventing innovation from happening. Do you feel like now that you're in the space and you're building something and you've had to grapple with the the regulatory blockades around innovation head on, has that shifted your perception of why education has been so stagnant for so long? Like, do you feel like you, I don't know, like maybe we can chalk some of it up to the fact that you're just not allowed to do things maybe more than one might realize before one has gotten deep in the weeds on trying to battle with the regulatory side of things? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of two separate things. There's insights on why more things like this don't exist, which is what we just talked about. And then there's once you exist, you are now just plan you you now have entered the game, right? And now you have the normal hard work of inventing a brand new thing that didn't exist, right? Um <laughs> in a in a market like education, which is largely about psychology instead of physics, like uh there's so many different variant opinions on things like curriculum or the values implied in education. So that's what I was saying before about like dreaming of working on, on rockets, right? It would just be <laughs> when there's a clear objective answer uh, that everyone agrees with, it's, it's a lot easier, even if it's still hard in its own ways. Um, the, I would say the biggest insight, and this, this is kind of an interesting rabbit hole to get down uh, into if you, if you want, when you run a space that is totally voluntary, you understand why there is a temptation for institutions for kids to coerce, right? It is easy to get the outcomes you want when you can force those outcomes. So something like noise level, like the way that you solve noise level in a mixed age environment with 100% certainty is to put kids in nice little rows and tell them to be quiet and not talk until the bell rings, right? That's that's how you solve that problem easily. Um, it is much more nuanced and complicated to solve that in a free, like non-coercive way. Um, I just don't think people have tried hard enough. So we've kind of started by the default that we're saying we're never going to coerce. So we have to solve these problems in a different way. But it's certainly running something like Moonrise makes you understand why things are the way they are better. Can you talk a little bit? I'm so curious about how you think about environment design, which is one of the mm. aspects of education that I personally find super interesting. Like the, the philosophy and the psychology of how you set up a space that is mm. invitational to a child to do the types of things that you maybe would want to encourage them to do. And Anybody listening to this should absolutely go to the Moonrise website and should check out the pictures of your space because it is beautiful. It is high level design. Um, I am so Thank curious you. how you thought about setting up the space, both the types of things in it and the flow of the space, like how the pieces fit together and how you wanted kids to move through it and how you wanted them to feel when they're inside of it. Um, there's so many things that go into this, right? Like the way the space looks and feels as part of your marketing materials. You want to sell parents on this is a great place to leave your kids. But it's also from a very functional standpoint, such a yes. huge part of how it actually serves the children is how it is set up. I want to go, I actually want to go deep down this rabbit hole because I'm really fascinated by what you've done. Cool. This is probably my favorite rabbit hole. So, uh, so happy amazing to, to it. Um, <laughs> I guess the first, yeah, the, the first thing that's probably controversial to say is that from an aesthetic beauty standpoint, like the the controversial thing that I believe is that those are actually objective standards that can be hit, 
right? So, you know, it's very popular to say beauty is in the eye of the beholder and, and that sort of thing. And yet we kind of can look at something like, uh, like a flower and everybody agrees that a flower is beautiful, right? Nobody's saying that flowers aren't beautiful, right? And then we can look at something, I don't know, like a rat <laughs> and say that that's not, I, I don't know, pick your, pick your choice of what we consider not beautiful. Um, so that's my rockets. When I was talking about that example before, like mm -hmm. that's a clear target. It's less clear than math, but it is something that I can strive for that is kind of written on like a spidey sense and maybe like a like an inherent knack or interest that I have in design. But I kind of work on those things like the beauty problems and until it feels peaceful in my soul. <laughs> uh, that's that's how I work towards like the look of it. Um, and I think those are fairly objective, right? You can keep making progress on it just like anything else. But like there is such a thing as like a ugly space and a pretty space, which is why people take photos in front of churches and cathedrals and that sort of thing. Not typically in front of like, you know, blank concrete walls. Um, usability is the other thing. And I think usability is more interesting to talk about because it's harder. Um Usability is a little bit more subjective. And so the usability for children is different than the usability for adults, right? And this is where it gets into like intentional space design for kids. So you can design a space that looks beautiful to a child and to an adult, but the way that that space functions and is used is different for children and adults. Uh, so, so one example of that is kids often come in on a first visit and it's like being the new kid in class. Now, we are currently doing about five tours a day. And we're signing up, uh, I think, about 16 uh, new, uh, we call them risers, but kids per month. So we have a lot of first impressions at Moonrise. Um, nobody likes being the new kid, and everybody's shy at first. So a usability design standard that we care about a lot is how can we make that a really great experience? Like how can we remove shyness and make this instantly feel like a place where they feel at home? And so one thing we do is what do you do when you get home? Like a lot of people take off their shoes, right? And go sit on the couch or something comfortable, right? So we have a little cubby right in front of the door when they walk in and we say, we greet them with a smile, figure out their name. And we say, hey, if you want, you can put your shoes in this cubby. And there's a big couch over there. It's about eight feet long by about four feet deep. You can go jump on that if you want. And sometimes they do, probably about 50% of the times they do, and sometimes they don't. But everybody feels more at home when that sort of thing is allowed. And that's the first thing they hear when they walk in the door. Um, so there's a lot of just kind of hospitality thinking that goes into this. Um, we have places where they can be up high and down low. So we have uh, scaffolding in the space, which is very unusual to a lot of people. But when you get into like how to actually allow kids to be high and low in a space that only has one floor is an interesting challenge. Uh, we have a library with a ladder that they can roll on. And the thinking there is that when you can put something in front of books that's fun and, and novel, then it will increase the amount of time that they will look and uh, read read the books, look at and read the books. Um, I'm kind of giving you a lot to, to play with here. The, the maker space has toolboxes that don't have locks on them or, or stay unlocked. So they can just go over and take anything out of the, the drawers whenever they want to make something instead of asking for permission. All of this is in service of making this feel like a place where they don't have to ask for permission and where they can feel like it's designed for them and not for some predetermined objective that their parents or the administrators have. I love this. How, because you talked about writing like a whole thesis for this in 2019 before you actually started the process of building how much of that thesis mm -hmm. was around the design of the environment. Like if you're not providing a curriculum and you're not providing a set structure for the kids and everything is voluntary, then the space within which they are interacting with you and the space that they're interfacing with becomes one of the most important components because it is the invitation to do the types of things that you would like mm. them to do. The books are there as an invitation to read. You like I imagine that you think reading is a good thing for kids to be doing. You'd like them to be reading. 
So you make it appealing for them and easy for them to read. And that's like a core feature in the space. You have, I imagine that you think it is good for kids to be making things. So you set up a space that is full of, you make it as easy as possible, but also as inviting as possible to come over and start working on something. How much was that like a core part of the entire thesis around what you were building? You know, oddly, almost zero. Um, Really? The original thesis reads reads much more like a, yeah, it it reads much more like a Bitcoin white paper. I'll publish it at some point um, and, you know, just put it out there for the world to read. Um, the, The thesis is much more about how to fix the education system and why things haven't changed um, and then what to do to replace it. So it occurred to me that, you know, just just as one example, like the central point of the thesis was what I started the conversation with. Like we have all of like uh, Pink Floyd's uh, The Wall came out in like the 1970s and it was an indictment of the education system. Like that's what that song is about. And, you know, there's all these famous books and famous tech leaders. Everybody's criticizing the education system. And, you know, it kind of occurred to me that, like, the only people really proposing new solutions were all proposing new solutions with software. And, you know, we had at that point when I wrote the thesis, a pretty decent run of good shots on goal from a software perspective. So there was something called alt school that was very well funded. I want to say they raised over $300 million. It was run by ex Google guys. Um, Khan Academy had existed for a while. Um, there were lots of shots on goals to, uh, on goal to fix this and nothing had worked. And that was fascinating to me because everybody agrees. This is like a huge problem, like maybe the most important problem to solve. And, we kind of took our shots at it like we did with any other industry when software uh, was exploding and it wasn't working. So I tried to figure out why. And I think it's because school has both a learning function and a childcare function. And everybody was focusing on the learning curriculum function. Nobody was focusing on the childcare function. So the thesis is mostly about that. And then what to do with that if that insight is correct and what it means. Um, yeah. Um, the, the design stuff I think is both because I'm a, I'm a design nerd and I've just read a lot about it. Like I'm a huge follower of Christopher Alexander. Um, I wondered about that. (laughs) Yeah. Oh yeah. We should talk about Christopher Alexander. I mean, so I, I ran another company called 10 rocket where I scoped and started doing initial designs for over 300 apps. So I just got into design thinking a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, so I felt confident that I knew what to do when it came to design. Um, like, and you know, I'm not, I didn't invent the idea that tools should be accessible. Like Montessori wrote about that a long time ago. Um, you know, maybe we added some new cool ways of accessing tools. Um, but you know, you can go into a Montessori school and there's low shelves with things on it. So I felt most of the innovation needed to be in the core model of how we raise and develop kids as human beings. Today's episode is sponsored by my friends at the John Galt Mortgage Company. My friends Mitch and Tim launched the John Galt Mortgage Company last year after spending years working in the real estate world and realizing that mortgages are way more expensive than they need to be. Most people don't realize how much extra profit is baked into the cost of a mortgage. Most real estate agents don't even know. So Mitch and Tim decided to build a new kind of mortgage, one where they voluntarily cap their profit on every transaction. And by lowering their commission, they pass the savings on to you, the buyer, in the form of a lower interest rate than what everyone else is charging. I talked to Mitch and Tim just the other week, and they told me about multiple examples of customers who are saving literally hundreds of dollars a month on their mortgage payments compared to what they would be paying with a traditional lender. Mitch and Tim are old friends of mine who believe in economic liberty, entrepreneurship, and financial independence. They also named their company the John Galt Mortgage Company, which tells you everything you need to know about them. If you're in the market for a house, you can find out more about what they're doing at www.johngaltmortgage.com, or you can find a link to their site down in the show notes. Okay, back to the interview. So <sighs> there's so much here that's really interesting. I want to stay on your point for a second about 
innovation all focusing on software and not environments. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the things that really excites me about what you're doing is that it is a very explicit unbundling of the services that school provides. Mm-hmm. And unbundling is a very cheap to throw out round buzz term in the startup world. It's, you know, people people love to talk about unbundling. Mm-hmm. You see it crop up in all sorts of places. But it's actually a really important concept inside of education because when you purchase schooling for your child and if you're a taxpayer, you're purchasing education, whether you want to or not, whether you have kids or not, you're purchasing a bundle of goods. And it's a set of things that there's really no good reason why they all have to go together and they all artificially constrain each other by nature of them all having to function as a unit as opposed to functioning separately. Um, and two of the most obvious examples are academics and childcare. Um, so much of how we do academics is structured around the school day. And the school day functions as a necessary component of a society where most households have become two-income households and both parents need to be functioning in the workforce during normal business hours. And school exists as a place for the kids to Mm -hmm. go so that everything else in society can function smoothly. And there's almost this disincentive for innovation in the academic side of things when you have the constraints of childcare baked into the structure because it is very common knowledge for anybody who's doing anything innovative in education that academics really only need to take a couple hours a day unless a kid is deeply interested in a particular topic and they want to go deep down the rabbit hole, which paradoxically happens very frequently if you let kids, you leave them to their own devices and you let them chase the things that they're interested in. They're probably going to want to spend more than two hours a day on learning eventually when they hit on something that's deeply compelling to them. But all of the standard requirements that kids need to access or like need to work through in order to have a functional base knowledge to be able to interface with the world, they understand, you know, basic math and basic literacy. And, you know, they have enough of a liberal arts grounding to understand Mm -hmm. how we got here, where we're going, what are the scientific mechanics that are driving that. You can get all that in a couple hours a day tops. Mm -hmm. But if schools actually delivered academics in a couple hours a day tops, it would destroy the entire childcare model because they'd have to rework from the ground up how they're – what are kids doing for the rest of the day? Why are they there? How are they spending their time? It's such a fundamental reworking of the system. So even though we have technology that allow us to educate kids in a couple hours a day in ways that was much more difficult when the only way to convey knowledge was through books and teachers in front of the classroom. Like we didn't have tech tools that could automatically and almost instantaneously tailor to the needs of every child so they can actually move at their own pace. Like we'd have to rework everything and it would be an enormous mess. But because the child care po- component is baked into it, mm-hmm. there's also this disincentive to even tackle the problem because it's a good thing that kids are in school for seven hours a day anyway. Like they have to go somewhere. And so when you start to unpack these different things, Mm -hmm. you're able to just focus on what is the best possible childcare like service for families. Like what would that look like? Yes. The constraints of delivering academics like does like that's not even it's not even the same service like we don't even have to think about that and you can design just a space that is epic in the same way that something like Khan Academy doesn't have to think about well we have to keep kids occupied for seven hours a day and we have to like organize them somehow in classrooms and keep them all contained it can just focus on delivering right. great academics and it can crush it at that because it doesn't have to fit inside of the you know 45 minute class period five 
days a week, you know, 180 mm -hmm. days a year structure. And so I find this unbundling thing really interesting. And I find what you're doing really interesting because it's an angle of this that people don't think about quite as much. Like they think about the unbundling of the academics more, the childcare component less, but this is mm -hmm. such an important part of the conversation if we're going to win this education thing. Like this has to get solved. Yeah, that was very well said. Um, there's so many things to dive into there. I mean, in so many ways, the entire model is based on a just fundamentally flawed premise. And it gets worse every year as technology gets better. Um, so you mentioned the idea that academics can, can be done in less than two hours a day. Now, what's funny is that schools, not funny, I guess, Schools, even if they just focused on academics, still have a flawed mo model for delivering on academics. Oh, like yeah. uh, there are there are programs that are now personalized online that deliver academic content to the individual learner um, in a much more efficient way that reaches them uh, in, in a much more understandable way on devices that they like using better than sitting in lectures. Right. So everything about the experience of learning academics, I mean, unless you are, I, I mean, there's, there's, I'm sure a few children out there or some percentage that like the kind of standard lecture delivery model. Um, but I mean, no, no parent is worried about addiction to lectures. A lot of parents are worried about addiction to screens, right? Like this is just a superior information delivery model. So if you're going to deliver academics, like it's absurd to think that the way to deliver academics is through a lecture, right? Um, so even if we, we haven't even gotten into unbundling yet, right? The thing that they are supposed to be good at, they are not good at, right? Um, and then you get into space design, which oddly enough, space design is more objective from a criteria standpoint than learning is. The, the, the reason we have grades is because we had to make up a kind of arbitrary idea to show that some progress has happened on learning. But when we become adults, we all know how flawed the idea that grades equal learning is. Like a lot of us had great grades, but can't remember, you know, hardly anything about the things that we supposedly learned. Um, everybody knows this. So like, even when you talk to very adamant public school supporters, nobody, almost nobody seems to dispute the idea that, that grades equal learning, right? It's just that we have to kind of agree to these terms to continue playing the game. And if you give up the game, it's absurd to hold that philosophy anymore. Um, space design is, is uh, I guess, paradoxically more objective because almost everybody agrees on the things that we like. We like comfortable places to sit. We like natural light. We like plants. Um, you know, we, we tend to like some places to be quiet and heads down and some places to be out in the open. And so, you know, that's why I'm, that's why I mentioned that that's like my physics problem is because I can go to a building and I can make that objectively nice to be in. But if you said, Chris, how do I design a system to where every single individual who uses it will like learning this thing in this way? It's nearly an impossible task because people are different, have different interests. Um, and different schedules, <laughs> right? Different, different everything. And the internet is a fantastic tool for facilitating learning because it allows for that diversity, right? So if you combine, this is, this is what's happened in work too. We're combining the internet with different places other than offices in your house to, to work. Um, the same thing is happening with learning. It's the, it's the same fundamental unbundling where both of those things can do their own thing really well. What are the learning modalities that you feel like best interface with Moonrise? Are there approaches that do better than others? Because you mentioned that not all your students are homeschooled. So are there are there things that seem to be a better fit yeah. overlaid on top of an environment like Moonrise? I mean, certainly homeschooling is is the is the best, right? Like if you are a homeschooler and then you add Moonrise, like typically that will be a much better experience than just doing homeschooling. Um, the reason why it's better is because of all the things that don't come bundled with homeschooling when you choose to, to homeschool. So if we can give a lot of those things back to you, the, the desirable thing, like most people don't 
start homeschooling because they uh, dream of packaging academic content for their kids together and kind of being responsible for that, right? It's like they want to spend more time with these people. They're concerned about, you know, bullying at school. They want more ability to personalize their curriculum and help them find their interests. They think schools are a waste of time. So nothing that we do at Moonrise precludes all the great things about homeschooling, but we can add back a lot of the things that you that you give up when you make that decision. Um, so, you know, I, I would think that that's the best. Generally speaking, Moonrise is the absence of a curriculum, meaning that we like work with public school students just as well as we can work with a homeschool student. It's just that the the public school student is overserved by the public school in a lot of different ways and underserved in some really important ways. So Moonrise serves them at all the underserved ways to the extent that they are able to be here. Um, sometimes that's, you know, a couple, couple hours a week, right? But the time that they're there means a lot because they're so underserved by school in that way. And specifically to get into that point, those are, mm -hmm. they are underserved on creativity, wellness, independence. Those are the, the three main ones that school doesn't really help with. Makes it worse, actually. <laughs> I want to go down the independence rabbit hole a little bit because this is another interesting aspect of what you're doing. You have 125 kids who are currently members of Moonrise Risers. How many of them are in the space at a given time? Do you mm -hmm. have a, a limit on how many can be in the space? Yes. Uh, so to answer your first question, on a given time when you walk in, it's between... Um, 15 and 30 at a, at a given okay. point. Sometimes it's higher, sometimes it's lower, but the average is going to be between 15 and 30. So we, we uh, could fit in our building legally about 75 kids. Um, so when I mentioned that we could double membership without much of a problem, you know, it's very rare for there to be more than 35 in the space at any one time. And so we can accommodate as many as 75 um, you know, and still be in compliance with our building standards and that sort of thing. So that's what makes us confident that we could have at least 300 members on the current model. That's amazing. So you have sometimes more than a classroom's worth of kids in your space. The model can accommodate multiple classrooms worth of kids at a given point in time. Um, and they're not doing anything structured. They're not being told to sit down quietly until the clock hits a certain number. They're not being told, well, now it's reading time, so you're going to be reading. They're freely engaging with the space. How do you think about the independent side, both from a practical standpoint, because to those of us who are in the education world, we're like, yeah, this totally makes sense. But people who are newer to alternatives to public school to, the, to them that's what sound like a nightmare you're corralling 30 kids at a time that sounds terrible um how do you think about that and also like the independent side of thing is such a value for you and we can go deep down like the rabbit hole of taking children seriously here there's like there's a lot we can get yes. into but how how does that work practically yeah. but also how do you think about what it could and should be yeah so Structure is different, and I know you know this, structure is different than force, right? So Moonrise isn't entirely unstructured, but it is entirely free of coercion, right? Um, so we, I mentioned uh, we have about 50 learning experiences a week that happen at Moonrise, and they're all different kinds of things. We have kind of categories of experiences that range from, I'll just say a few of them, like field trips, courses, clubs, eventually we'll do apprenticeship, uh, we have Moonrise Ventures where they start businesses here and they work on that. And, you know, you can think of these almost like um, like guided experiences. So we have learning guides. Uh, it's not just you open the doors and there's only kids there. Uh, we have learning guides that run several of these experiences. And that's not so different than a gym, right? Like if you go to a gym, sometimes there's a free weight area. Um, sometimes there is a uh, like a classroom area. And, you know, it would be absurd to think that if you say, okay, I'm going to take this, uh, this class that I can't walk out if I'm not liking the class and just go down to the free weight area because I like that more, right? Um, so we simply allow for that. And what that does is it has a very 
good forcing function for uh, increasing the quality of our experiences. Because if our experience quality is low, the risers won't want to do them, right? When you make something voluntary, it has to be really good. <laughs> uh, and so, you know, so what we find is that over time, we get better and better at hosting experiences that they want, which means giving them cool things to build, typically, and interesting and novel things to learn that they can't learn anywhere else. Um, yeah, and so there's plenty of structure. There's just zero force. <laughs> I know you spend a lot of time around thinking about the idea of taking children seriously. Um, and I want to go down that mm -hmm. rabbit hole too. Um, I've had a couple conversations about this on the podcast. Um, about the the philosophy of it, about the the sort of general paradigm, but I want to talk about what it means from a practical standpoint for you to actually like both how you think about it, but also like what it means in the context of building a space where you're interfacing with many kids on a daily basis, and you want to treat them with the level of autonomy that most of the world denies them, but that you believe with conviction they deserve yeah. yeah i mean the starting point with moonrise is that kids are people that's like the unalienable belief behind all of this is that kids are people and i guess the second step or maybe the precursor depending on how you're thinking about it is the value of people in the universe and the cosmic scheme of things, how people should be treated, human rights, that sort of thing. If you imagine the universe without people, it's empty, vast, unexplorable, not knowing of itself, anything like that. The second that you insert people into the equation, all of a sudden things start changing, right? Like there is now an awareness of the, of the universe. There is a ability to expand. There's a sense of meaning and happiness. And so so every human life is is this incredibly momentous thing to happen. And the unit of that of the most significant thing in the universe, like the the unit of that is a person. So when a child is born into the world, that is the most substantial unit in the universe, right? The existing model and way of just thinking about people is to not take that seriously at all or believe anything that I said. It's to mechanize it, put it on a conveyor belt, control it, and try to tease it towards some known outcome that feels safe to humans <laughs> that have also been on that conveyor belt for the most part, right? And... I think this is probably the greatest tragedy in in the world. I mean, everything flows downstream from human creativity. And the way that you stifle creativity is to force known outcomes. Literally, the act of creation is novelty, new things existing. So if you only force known outcomes, you will never have creativity and you will never have progress. So the only way to ensure the the ultimate survival and expansion of, of humans and, and therefore meaning and, and purpose and beauty in the universe is to take human life seriously and to create systems that enable human creativity, progress, and flourishing. So even within that belief, let's say that's the most extreme taking seriously view of that belief of the importance of, of humans, right? there is a range of how seriously people take that belief. Um, so you might argue that the most, uh, like slavery takes it 0% seriously. That would be some some uh, very extreme version on the negative side, right? And Moonrise, or my belief here being, being on the opposite side. There are plenty of well-meaning private schools that take kids more seriously than a public school but still don't fully take them seriously, right? So sometimes I describe Moonrise as 
almost like inventing democracy when you've only had kingdoms before. Um, you can imagine before the United States, there being such a thing as a good king. But the entire idea of monarchy is flawed on first principles, and you need democracy to exist in order to unlock a new level of human flourishing. So I think Moonrise is an experiment in democracy, so to speak. It's a, it's a brand new way of looking at kids and fully taking them seriously and never like the, the whole point of that experiment is to take them seriously and treat them as people. And so if we have to adjust those values and take them less seriously, then by, by definition, the experiment was flawed from the beginning and you default back to what already exists. Right. So we can't ever lose sight of that. I'm really stuck on the ways that you're framing up the idea of creativity, because I think this is really important and I think it's really easy to underappreciate the idea that when you're merely striving towards fixed pre-prescribed outcomes that creativity cannot exist. But simultaneously, there are different kinds of creativity. Like if you go to a place that does not have a private school, we'll use an education example to keep it consistent with the the frame up of how we got here. Um, you go somewhere that doesn't have a private school, you find a building, you set up a space, you have, you know, cr recruit a student body, you hire teachers, you launch, you have created something in a place where it didn't exist before. That is an act of creativity, but it's also creativity within a set of mm -hmm. constraints where there are regulations that you need to meet in order to set up a school. There is a playbook around how to design the space, how to you know, structure the expectations around the teachers, how to recruit the students and the expectations around them, how the school day is going to function. Like it's somewhere in between a complete act of creativity where you're birthing something very, very new and birthing an iteration of something mm -hmm. that has already existed in a new place. It's kind of like Peter Thiel's idea of zero to one, which you mentioned earlier that you can... Yes create something completely new moving from zero to one there's like nothing existed and then something did versus one to n where you're taking an idea that already mm -hmm. existed and then you're iterating yes. upon it you're building you're you're changing it somehow or building it in a new place but you're operating off of an idea that already exists mm. there's such a spectrum of creative mm -hmm. acts um and I think that's a when you're talking about facilitating creativity in kids, but also facilitating creativity in entrepreneurs who are building mm -hmm. things like you are, where you're you know building a new type of mm -hmm. environment for kids, a new offering for parents in the education of their children. I think this kind of stuff is really important to just look at head on and be philosophical about because if creativity is a value, and for probably anyone listening to this show, I feel pretty confident saying it probably is a value. It still can be a very nebulous mm -hmm. thing to understand. Like if your kid takes a coloring book and pencils and colors the coloring book, like they are being creative to some extent, like they're, you know, choosing the colors that go in the space. They're like making it in, in, inside of the lines are making it colorful, but that's not the same kind of creativity as taking a, piece of paper and drawing a picture of a person in the way that their, you know, maybe their older cousin or their older sibling mm. showed them like, here's how you draw a face and here's how you make the body proportional. And they learn these tools to draw people that look more realistic and they're being creative because they're taking a piece of paper and modifying it in ways when it like it needed an infusion of human creativity in order for it to look the way that it does to become something but that's still not the level of creativity as if they took a piece of paper and they drew something not just in the way that their older sibling or cousin showed them how to draw a person but they're innovating on that and doing something new which is again entirely different than you know taking a piece of paper and being constrained by the piece of paper and the art tool supplies that they have like maybe they go outside and they take a bunch of stones and they start to shape out a picture on the ground or they take 
fallen leaves or they draw on something else. Like there's so many iterations of how creative creativity can be. And I think the way that you were talking about it is very interesting, mm-hmm. but I think it's also an important, a really important philosophical rabbit hole here because you can completely be on board with the idea that creativity is a value, but not fully grasp all the different ways in which creativity can manifest and the fact that they're not all created equal and they don't all serve the same purpose and they don't all necessarily lead to the types of outcomes in creative thinking that you would hope your child would embody by the time they become an adult. Yes. Um, super well said. There. <laughs> okay, let's start at the bedrock. Like, what is creativity? By the way, if we knew how creativity worked, we could program. It. <laughs> so we don't have the full understanding of, of programming creativity, lest we would have uh, artificial general intelligence, not just not just <laughs> AI, right? Um, so how do we define it at at the bedrock, right? I I tend to think that creativity is essentially problem solving. It's not, you know, it's, there's a very narrow definition that is popular, you know, in like colleges and art schools where the creative people go to the to the arts and the humanities and the engineering people go to, you know, the the sciences and maths, right? Um, both of those are creative to the extent that they solve problems, right? Um, so, you know, this is also why it distinguishes us in some regard from other species is the complexity of the problems that we can solve, right? So other animals tend to be somewhat fixed in the scope uh, of the problems that they're able to solve, right? So, you know, if you go to an octopus and say, you know, draw a cat, <laughs> it can't, right? But, you know, uh, like a three-year-old child could, could do that, right? Uh, so, but, but there is something going on in, in an octopus that causes it to uh, change color or look at a piece of coral and say, okay, uh, that's blue coral, change to blue. Um, you know, not change to red, right? There's a selection and a variation there that's important on some level. Um, so if, if creativity is problem solving and then everything matter, everything that matters is about complexity, this also explains kind of what's happening in, uh, in AI circles right now. So I can get on ChatGPT right now and I can say, write me a story about Santa Claus going back in time and giving a present to Charles Darwin right? Like, and it'll do a pretty good job of that much faster than most people would be able to do that. So the the quality that it gets to in 10 seconds is almost superhuman, it would seem. The value of that, of solving that problem is not at anywhere close to the type of value that comes from human creativity yet, right? So it is solving problems, like it's solving problems of the sort that, you know, we've started testing uh, customer service chatbots that are, you know, several orders of magnitude more efficient from a business perspective than a, than a human, right? Um, but that kind of tells you something about being a chat re- agent on a customer service line, that it's not the sort of creativity that people think of when they say, I want my kids to be creative in the future. Even if it is creative, it's not the sort of thing that we're going for. So what you definitely can't do with chat GBT right now, uh, or most people, <laughs> I mean, you know, is, is say cancer is a problem. Uh, how do we cure cancer? Right. It's not going to spit back any meaningful response to that. What it'll spit back is all the innovations that humans have made towards those goals over the, t- over time, right? The best explanations we have today, which are still incomplete. So I think what's important about humans and about unlocking creativity is our ability to solve any theoretical problem as long as it obeys the laws of physics. So it is completely beyond the current uh, knowledge of humans how to um, get to the next habitable planet in a reasonable lifespan, right? It is not completely outside of the laws of physics. And so what that means is that creativity is what gets in between those things over time and helps us solve that problem. The things that we're doing now 
with mobile phones would have been as conceivable as what I just said to humans 500 years ago as us moving to the next planet in a lifetime, uh, next, next habitable planet, um, in, in a lifetime, right? So it's, it's just human creativity and our ability to solve complex problems that gets in the middle of those two things. And, um, that's the sort of creativity I think that matters and that we're striving for here. So how do you teach that kind of thinking, that kind of problem solving? I know this is the million dollar question, but I'm curious how you <laughs> think about teaching it um, Yeah, in the context of what you're building. Because I think everybody's in agreement that school does a terrible job of it. Um, most people who grow up to be very creative thinkers are that way in spite of the education that they received, not because of it. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think it's a stretch to argue that a lot of people are born highly creative and have it quashed out of them. Or maybe a better question is how did your creative thinking develop? Because like what you're doing is a highly creative exercise. You're trying to create something that doesn't readily exist. There are not lots of models of spaces like Moonrise that you can go draw from and then start one in your own town. You're taking a very zero to one approach to building something. Um, where did that come from for you? What was your process like? Um, so I've come to believe that it it's less to do about like an external source. Like there's never been anyone that taught me to desire to fix the education system or uh, more accurately try to build a new one. Um, mm -hmm. I think, I think the most important thing that I've learned is the importance of problem selection. So it's not a lack of creativity. Most people apply their creativity, I think, to less interesting problems. Um, so one example of this, I think Paul Graham has an essay about stamp collectors um, where he talks about how obsessed you have to be to be like a world-class stamp collector, like browsing eBay, um, setting up, you know, automated systems to send you emails, you know, when a certain type of stamp hits the market. It's, it's a, <laughs> in some ways, it's a highly creative endeavor to the extent that you have to think of ways to set up your life to help optimize for maximizing the value of your stamp collection, right? The stamp collection has very little utility for humanity. And probably, I mean, if, if that person is obsessed, maybe it has lots of utility for them personally, but it doesn't really go. It's a bit like being obsessed with a video game, right? And this is what people I think get right about video games. It's not that there's anything inherently wrong with video games. It's that if all you do is play video games, you're limiting the impact that your creativity, which you're applying to that game, the impact that it can have on other people, right? So you're applying your creativity at the moment to, um, you know, building an audience that moves towards a better future for kids and parents and families and education specifically, right? Like that's, mm -hmm. that has an impact. We're talking today. You have listeners, right? Um, so I, I think most of this, and some of it's not by choice in some ways, like I am actually genuinely interested in design. I don't remember waking up and forcing design into my brain as an interest. I just kind of am. Um, <laughs> so I, I think this is also why philosophy is important. So learning about philosophy changed the things that I valued. Um, specifically reading a book called The Beginning of Infinity uh, really changed, I think, my whole perspective on the world. It was like putting on a different pair of glasses that never come off. Um, once your philosophy changes, then the problems that you care about solving uh, change, and then your creativity can start having more impact. Have you ever read any Christopher Lockhead? No, I haven't. He wrote a book called um, Niche Down and another one called Play Bigger. I read both of them years ago when I was working for Praxis, the, which was like my first foray into the education world. Um, mm -hmm. And he, he's been the CMO of, I forget how many companies, like he's mul multiple. Um, 
but his whole like it's kind of parallel in my mind to the zero to one idea. Like he talks a lot about category creation, which is the idea of mm. instead of just like building a competitor in an existing market, you're creating a new market. Um, so like instead of having sure. like just building, you know, a competitor to a taxi company you want to get into transportation instead of just building a competing taxi company in your city you build uber you're building something that is mm -hmm. a new category of product um which i think is very very akin to what you're doing with moonrise um and it's another it's, it was a really useful way for me to start thinking about innovation um because his books are very they're very practical. They're for people who actually want to do the thing. They want to build new verticals and they want to figure out both how to build the thing, but more importantly, the positioning. Like, how do you talk about building something new? How do you educate people who've never seen a product like this on what it is and why it doesn't fit in one of the preconceived, you know, you talk about the 13 boxes that the state of Georgia has. People have those in their heads too. They try to categorize new information that they're seeing. It's like, oh, this is like this other thing. Now I understand it. I could reorient myself in it. Um, if you're building something that doesn't fit in any of the pre-existing categories, like how do you think about the marketing problem of that? Um, I think you'd find his stuff really interesting, but I was curious if you'd encountered it because it feels like there's a lot of parallels in what you're doing with Moonrise. And that's one of the the pitfalls of being creative is that then you have to figure out how to like if you want to build something <laughs> super new just for the sake of building it, that's cool. But then if you have to like explain it to other people, that's a secondary problem that you also have to grapple with. Yeah, this is part of the now now you're playing the game and then you have normal table stakes of how to play the game well. And, <laughs> you know, it's it's hard to start companies just in general, right? So now we're just into the it's hard to start companies thing and then you get into it's hard to invent categories game. Um All right, so I I have encountered several times the idea of category creation. I've read a different book about it that I'm blanking on the name. Uh I want to say it had some pirate word in it or something like that. But anyway. Oh, yeah. Category pirates. That would be Chris Lockhead's brand. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Him. Okay, cool. Okay. Well, then very familiar with the ideas. Okay. Okay, cool. Um, yeah. I mean, we hit this problem of educating the market head on right when we launched, which was also right in the middle of Omicron. So we launched in December 2021, which was like right in the middle of Omicron. And we had a wait list of about 500 um, kids. And because of Omicron, we opened with about uh, 40, I think. Um, and at the time, we didn't have any, you know, copy position to homeschoolers or anything like that. It was very much, this is a brand new thing in the world. It's called a co-learning space. And, you know, you can use it in a number of different ways that include homeschooling, but also include uh, supplemental learning and even childcare, like flexible childcare when, when you need it. So one of the challenges that we faced, and I'm sure a lot of category creation people face, is that what ends up happening is that the market will sometimes reduce the idea down to the lowest common denominator of what they're familiar with. So like you said, when, when uh, it's probably, I, I bet a lot of people called Uber a taxi in, in the early days, right? Um, like, Moonrise, because it wasn't a full-time option, didn't actually get called to school very often, although that, that does happen. Um, what people started calling us back then was flex, like flexible childcare, like uh, just a space to drop my kids off. Now, to some extent, that is a component of what we're doing, a pretty large component, right? But we also don't call Starbucks flexible adult care, <laughs> you know, or a coffee shop. Um, like <laughs> we, we go there to do important things and get work done. So in some ways for, for us, it's, it's great. Whatever gets a child to come to moonrise, uh, whatever compels the, the parent to bring them there. Once, once they're there, that's a win for us, right? Because we know that it's not just them sitting around and doing nothing. Like there's meaningful things going on there. Um, and they're, they're actually learning and making friends and, and that sort of thing. 
but the the market perception does matter a lot and this is why we've we've kind of since uh evolved our positioning a little bit towards you know what i called earlier the the 10x better use case right because it really is important for people to at the very least get why this is important and how to use it and you know one of the i guess concepts of marketing is especially in the early days it's better to be specific than to be vague um it's probably not a universal rule, but with something like education, especially like I think it's better to be specific and and uh, focus on the context. So we'd rather them put Moonrise in that context and for us to be focused on that customer segment because they are the literal pioneers that are actually pulling kids out of the system and doing something themselves. Right. So that use case is is more relevant and they're getting more value out of Moonrise uh, than, than when we started. Uh, but our long-term vision is to build something closer to, uh, I, I mean, we call it the real world for kids, right? Like physical reality that kids can exist in where they are part of the world in this safe ecosystem. What is the vision for Moonrise? Like you have one location right now that you're working on growing. Um, it's still very new, obviously, but what is... What are the big goals for what you want this to become and how you want it to scale? Yeah. I mean, I think this is this is going to sound grandiose, but I really do think of Moonrise as something more akin to like like a world that children can occupy. And that is a unique opportunity only because they have been excluded from reality, like almost categorically. So so much so that we say to you know, 18 year olds or 22 year olds, welcome to the real world when they graduate. Um, it's it's as, not only as if it's literally the case that they have existed in a simulation for the formative years of their lives. Right. And now they've actually got to learn what it looks like to exist in reality and start doing things like creating value and figuring out what that's like and uh, paying for housing and finding a, a spouse and all, all kinds of stuff. So. You know, I'm just of the belief that simulations have their place, but they certainly aren't like you you wouldn't want to spend all of your time in a simulation, just like you wouldn't want to spend all of your time in a video game. So you learn much faster by encountering reality than you do simulations, I think. Uh, And the lessons from dealing with reality typically are more valuable than those of dealing with simulations. This is a long winded way of saying that you know, I can walk out of my house right now and go to about 30 different places that are designed for me, you know, th- that are within, you know, a, a 10 minute drive. I can't say anything like that for my kids. And so having physical reality for kids, connected transportation nodes, um, public spaces where they can be in and be safe, uh, buildings like Moonrise, uh, a connected network of guides to uh, to facilitate their learning along the way. All of these things are are part of of the long term vision. It just so happens that spaces are kind of the the beachhead to getting there. Like you need a physical space for them to go. That's the one that lands the most in parents' brains. And parents are somewhat of a bottleneck as the enablers of of access at this point. I was curious about that too. It sounds like you had. It sounds like you have a lot of interest in what you're doing you're giving multiple tours a day you said your initial wait list was 500 people um what are the biggest sales bottlenecks for people like if people kind of get what you're doing and they're interested in it and the price point isn't excessive it's not you know it's it's not inexpensive but it's not you know frighteningly prohibitive by any stretch of the imagination what are the biggest pain points Mm -hmm. in in making parents either understand what it is that you're doing, if you feel like that's the bottleneck or in selling them on yeah. the value of it for their kids, if that's if that's the sort of point of drop off. Mm. Um, a couple of things. Um, we are positioned towards homeschooling now. And it just so mm-hmm. happens that even though it's the fastest growing market of education, there is still a relatively, relative meaning compared to uh, other forms of education, there's a relatively small density of homeschoolers in a given market than there are compared to kids in general, right? So so that's one of the problems. We're growing at a rate faster than most venture-backed 
private schools and micro schools. Uh, I should say micro schools because there's not m- many or any venture backed private schools that I'm aware of. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, we expect to be at like we made the homeschool focus and pivot uh, about this time last year. And at that point, we had 30 members. So we have grown by about 100 members since then. Um, and we should be at about 250 by this time next year. Uh, so, you know, in education, going from zero to fully booked out on a new model in uh, in a relatively small market in two years is pretty awesome. Um, but I don't want to stop there. Obviously, I have grand ambitions. Um, I would say that the biggest reason why somebody wouldn't sign up is either they're not ready to homeschool yet or they're not going to use Moonrise enough yet to justify the monthly membership fee. So we do have uh, some new model changes that are coming up that are more uh, flexible for use. Uh, I can't get into what those are too much, but I believe it will solve, we we call that the expected utilization problem. So I think we have the solution there that we should be launching uh, with our updated app uh, in May. From there, it's about replication. I, I don't like replicating errors. And so when I'm aware of errors, like I want to fix them before we start replicating them. Uh, so most of our decision to only have one location is about getting this space as close to a replicable model that I feel comfortable with as possible. You'll never solve all errors before replicating, but you can at least solve the the ones that feel important to solve before before replicating. But I think we've we've hit, I want to say we're over 20 countries now where people have organically reached out about opening a moonrise, pretty much every state. And then I think our total inquiries organically are over 200. These are like potential, you know, uh, owners of a moonrise location or or, uh, facilitators. So there's certainly demand geographically, like what we're dealing with is demand at the per space level. So before we allow somebody else to run a moonrise, we want to make sure that that's all buttoned up to where it's an, it's a no brainer and is unlikely to fail. Mm -hmm. Is there for people who are not based in Atlanta, which is the majority of the listener base of this show, but who are intrigued about what you're doing, do you have any sense of a projected timeline of when you want to start expanding? Or if there are people listening who really want this for their own kids, but will be interested in being operators of a location, like, do you have a sense of what the timeline might be for this to start to expand? Or is that still very contingent on a lot of unknown variables being solved and therefore the time is also a very unknown variable? No, no, we have really good theories on all this. And, you know, we have insane customer love, uh, off the charts customer love, both from the parents and from the and from the kids. Uh, so we expect to be at 10 locations by the end of 2025. Okay. So it is a good time to reach out. Uh, yeah, like we, we can't, we can't really think of any reason why we couldn't be given our model and what we know uh why we couldn't be uh and shouldn't be at 10 locations by the end of next year so you know there's really two bottlenecks we have to find a really good person to run each location and we have to find a suitable building with those two things taken care of everything else is a funding problem and you know we have good investors and a really good product so we feel very optimistic about our prospects there um yeah, so 10 locations by the end of 25, and I actually want to be at 100 locations by the end of 2026. So we're going to start wow. growing quickly soon. <laughs> That's very exciting. I, w- I, I would love to see these in all over the country, I think, and all over the world. I think that this is such an interesting model. I'm really excited for larger, larger data sets to be able to be collected around how kids engage with these spaces and what Mm -hmm. types of things they get paired with and the different ways that they like an experience, an education experience with Moonrise as one of the pieces of it can, can start to look like. Um, So this is very exciting. And obviously the childcare component is a very big bottleneck for families around homeschooling, especially if one of the parents, you know, can maybe only, it's okay if they're only working part time, but they do need to be working some and they need a place to send the kids. 
Um, this is a very interesting solution for that. So I'm I'm excited to see this start to expand. Chris, if people have enjoyed this conversation and they want to learn more about what you're doing, obviously you guys have your website and stuff, but maybe they want to know more about you specifically, read some more of your content, where would you send them next? Mm. Most of my creative work is applied towards my companies and less towards content. So I'm I'm uh, like, I, I don't know if I'm ashamed, but I should admit that there's not a lot of content that I put out into the world other than what's on Twitter. Um, but they could follow me at, at underscore C Turner uh, if they want to kind of learn more about my daily ramblings, I suppose. Um, you know, it's it's really that and our website. Those are the those are the best ways at the moment to to reach me. I'm pretty accessible, so it wouldn't be too hard to find my email address and reach out. Um, and I'm pretty responsive too, so uh, shouldn't be too hard for an ambitious person. Amazing. I will drop links to your Twitter account and the Moonrise website in the show notes for people to find. Um, definitely reach out to Chris if you are interested in what Moonrise is doing, or if you're interested in being part of a newly opened location. Uh, Chris, thank you so much for taking the time for this. This has been a really fun conversation. Thanks for having me, Hannah. It was really fun. And thank you for all you're doing. I really appreciate it. The feeling is very mutual. Thank you for what you're doing too. I'm excited to do another one of these when what I'm doing has exploded and what you're doing has exploded. And we can have round two talking about all of the lessons learned as things are expanding and we're reaching more families and more kids are exiting the status quo model. It's going to be a good time. Sign me up. That sounds great. (laughs) Amazing. Thanks so much, Chris. All right, my friends, that is a wrap for today. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. I hope that you found this valuable. Please leave a five-star rating on Apple or Spotify. Please like the video on YouTube. And please don't forget to subscribe on whatever platform you listen to make sure that you don't miss next week's episode. Thank you so much, friends. I will see you next week.